Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study here right away. So we've been studying um, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And presently, we're looking at the book by Robert Whelan and um, Donald K. Short um, called 1888 Reexamined. We're looking at the the reissue of it, the republication of it in, uh, I guess, technically in 1987, but for this anniversary of 1888, so 1988. And... Um, uh, we had finished off with a quote from E.J. Wagner, which we're going to discuss and look at that a little bit more. So what we're doing here is he's giving some background history regarding Jones and Wagner in 1888 um, from his perspective of how he understands it. I have a bit different perspective, but they're similar. So anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> a dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the blessings of this past week, for the trials and uh, the triumphs. Uh, we are thankful that your spirit still speaks to our hearts and is speaking to the hearts of those around us. We know, Lord, that um, there's many things that we have a hard time learning, and we just ask that uh, we can make it easy on you in the work that you want to do in our lives, and that we can be a blessing to others. We pray for our family and friends, those in this movement, those who may not even know Christ, uh, that we are trying to win and draw to him. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, you can use us in whatever way you choose. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so... Last week, we finished off with this quote. Now, I had said that this quote was really taken out of context. And um, I'm actually going to do this. Uh, so I have here this book. And you know, it doesn't like to show it. Okay. You can see it's called The Confession of Faith by Dr. E.J. Wagner. Um, this was... Uh, taken from James White's Library, Andrews University, Bering Springs, Michigan Heritage Room. So this was, somebody did a uh, photocopy of this or something. And uh, this copy I have was my sister-in-law's copy when she was an Adventist. And she got it from uh, Herbert Cohen or somebody like that um, in British Columbia. And uh, um, so at least it came from his press originally. And um, so I'm not going to read through this, but uh, maybe I should, but I wish I had a good copy. I could probably find it online somewhere. It's not on the E.G. White disc of E.J. Wagner's uh, material. Uh, wasn't published while he was alive. It was found on his desk uh, when he died. And so um, when we go back to this document, the problem here is this is his account of of his experience. Looking back uh, um, 34 years previous. So 1882, he wrote this in uh, 1916. So um, I guess 16 plus 18 is 34. So that's why it's 34 years previous. Um, <clears throat> now, at this time, Wagner is out of the church. And one of the things that the review said regarding this is that he he places Wagner and Jones in a much more positive light than they should be. Now, and this is something that we need to discuss, uh, discuss about 1888. So Jones and Wagner both were out of the church. I mean, the, and, and we're going to look at how Jones left the church. But basically what happened with Wagner is he was sent to England. And, and while in England, um, 
he got caught up in pantheism. He also ended up having an adulterous affair and got divorced and married some some other person. And, and so that, of course, is grounds to remove his credentials and he'd no longer be a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, but even prior to that, he was writing material that was uh, pantheistic. And um, the, the book like The Everlasting Covenant, that's a good one if you want to read his pantheistic views. Um, his views start to get a little weird, obviously, once he's he's departing from Christ. Now, the question is, how can somebody who has, that God has used, end up departing from Christ? You know, we know the statement in the, in the scriptures that says, they went out from us. Um, how does that go? I'm just going to try to find the exact wording. Some to the effect they went out of from us because they weren't a part of us. Um, anybody know what that verse is? Yeah, so it's First John two verse nineteen, <clears throat> and it says, uh, "Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time." They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be that it they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So who is he talking about here in First John chapter two? Because you know we use this quote. Um, Right? So if somebody ends up leaving the faith, what's the idea? What's the idea? Like, um, mixed multitude or mixed... Uh, I don't know. Well, well, the idea would be, you know, somebody leaves the truth. So let's say we have somebody, they were in our movement, and uh, they go off into apostasy. I mean, the thing, we would use this, oh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Right? So we just say, they never understood what the message was. They weren't of God. But we know um, we've had a lot of light come from people who have left the movement, right? Um, Emiliano, he's the one who noticed Ezra 7 9. So the one thing we can say is that just because God has given you light, it doesn't guarantee uh, that you are going to continue walking in. Correct? Yep. Okay. So it's kind of discouraging sometimes. I mean, I remember when I first became an Adventist, I just figured, well, you know, and I'd see other people join the church. Oh, they joined the church. They kind of, you know, they're on their way. They're going to continue being Adventist, and then they would fall away. Right? And I've seen this happen so many times. You know, in my early experience, we had the upper room Bible studies. I remember one time this guy... Uh, showed up. He was a young guy. He would have been like 19 or something like that. He had read Uncle Arthur's Bible storybooks. Um, and he had looked up all the Bible references. So he studied the Bible using those as a guy. He ended up going to an evangelistic series, got baptized, came to our upper room Bible studies. He knew a lot about the Bible, but he didn't last long. Um, but But there are people who not just like that. There are people who have preached the message for a long time that God has used, and then they fall away. So how do we explain that? How do we explain Wagner's apostasy? And see, they're not it's really hard. addressing it. What's it's, that? Hard to, well, it's hard to explain. Yeah, because he it's had all of it. Now, we know that... Um, the way that the, the, these messengers were treated, treated or mistreated, had an effect upon uh, their experience. So, it doesn't excuse uh, the choices that Wagner made, but it also doesn't mean that the people who had 
basically created this opposition uh, to him that probably brought discouragement um, are also uh, not to be, uh, you know, they're not excused. Now, um, I can't remember the statement. Let's see. Um, There is a statement regarding Wagner and Jones, but I don't know the wording of it. Um, I don't know if anybody off hands knows that. Okay, so here. Okay, so uh, you put type in Wagner, Jones, and Messengers. Um, and you're going to find lots of statements, uh, 128 uh, statements or hits or whatever uh, regarding, is that right? Or is it just five? Okay, I see. Uh, okay. Okay, so I'm just going to read a few strip statements here. So they're not necessarily going to answer this question. Um, when you are enlightened by the Holy Spirit, you will see that the wickedness of Minneapolis as it is, um, as God looks upon it. If I never see you again in this world, be assured that I forgive you the sorrow and the distress and burden of soul you brought upon me without any cause. Uh, so she's writing to her nephew, Frank. Um, but for your soul's sake, for the sake of him who died for you, I want you to see and confess your errors. Uh, you did unite with those who resisted the spirit of God. And you had all the evidence that you needed that the Lord was working through brethren Jones and Wagner. But you did not receive the light. And after the feelings indulged, the word spoken against the truth. Um, you did not feel ready to confess that you had done wrong, that these men had a message from God and you had made light both of message and messengers. So one thing we can see is that they are uh, in the same statement. Um, this is another statement about them. Uh, the feelings cherished by yourselves, yourself and Elder Butler were not only despising the message, but the messengers. So what is this point about uh, the messengers? So I can't find the quote I'm looking for. But why does, why this emphasis upon the messengers, right? Because these messengers are going to fall away. And, um, and Peter's here, so maybe he knows where this quote is about Jones and Wagner, uh, the responsibility that is given to those who rejected the message and the messengers, and if they should fall away. So I don't know if anybody knows where that quote is. Um, but the idea that we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at, for those that just arrived, we're looking at... Um, 1888 re-examined, and there's a quote in there, uh, which is that we're, we're studying a little bit more about the apostasy of Jones and Wagner. And the reason why we're doing that is this quote um, is taken from uh, a paper called The Confession of Faith of Dr. E.J. Wagner. So here he's going to talk about his conversion. And um, so Wheeland and Short, they're, they're not giving us all the information. That is, they're talking about this conversion of Wagner that he writes 34 years after the event. And in the context here, uh, Wagner is using this uh, for a reason why he's actually rejecting Adventism. So if you've ever read 
the confession of faith of E.J. Wagner, which was found, uh, it was it was dated May sixteenth, um, nineteen sixteen, written just before his sudden death. So he gives this confession of faith, and he dies. Right, um, and the question really has to do with if somebody was given light, how do we account for the fact that they fall away? And we know that people use this as an excuse to reject the message of Jones and Wang. But we know that, that in part, their falling away is attributable to the response of the message and the treatment of the messengers, right? That doesn't take away their individual responsibility. But we, we know that the fact that they fell away ends up being a reason why people reject the message completely. Um, in Testimonies to Ministers, um, uh, which I read back in um, 1987, uh, the fall of 1987, I read Testimonies to Ministers because somebody had directed me to read some counsel that they were giving me in the spirit of prophecy about a decision that I needed to make to submit to um, a brethren above me regarding a personal decision that I had to make. And, um, and what they were doing was taking one statement of spirit in the spirit of prophecy and testimonies to ministers, but not any balancing statements. That is, Ellen White was writing to an individual who was resistant to receiving counsel and had sort of their own ideas of what they should do and, and decisions they should make in regard to the work. And Ellen White said they needed to submit uh, to, their, to the brethren of experience above them. But when she was writing to the brethren of experience regarding how we try to make decisions for others, um, the balancing is that if you treat others or see others in a certain way and you warn them, but you treat them badly, they will end up acting out basically how you have treated them. And you will then justify your treatment of them based upon how they act. Right? So Jones and Wagner's were treated badly when they fell away. Did that help people receive the message? Or was it more of an excuse to reject the message? And the answer would be more of an, an excuse to reject the message since Jones and Wagner fell away. Obviously, their message had a flaw. Is that logical thinking? More of an excuse to reject the message. And also, Ellen White was very clear that those who treated them like that will be judged quite harshly by God for it. Yeah, and she has a statement, something about even if they were to fall away, that that, that would be partly responsible on the way that they were treated. And, and I, I, I can't find, I don't remember the wording of it, so I can't find it in a, in a quick search. Um, maybe it'll show up in this, in this book, um, 1888 Reexamined. But the thing is, uh, they have taken this statement about Wagner's conversion, which I don't know if I necessarily trust it. That is, um, over the years, I've learned to not always trust what people say about what they've experienced. So he talks about how he saw for himself, um, you know, Christ hanging on the cross. He died for me almost like as a vision where I've read earlier accounts of this and this seems a little bit more exaggerated. And, and partly, he's already fallen away from the truth. He's rejected the sanctuary, the investigative judgment, and very weak arguments. One of them is he says, well, if, if Jesus had been ministering in the um, holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, wouldn't his blood be dried by now? Now, what kind of argument is that? Besides the fact that it's irrational, um, but what's what's the problem with that argument? 
saying, you know, saying, well, Jesus couldn't be ministering in the uh, in the heavenly sanctuary because the blood would be dry. What, what What's the problem with that argument? It's a literalist interpretation that uh, it's wrong. Yeah, it, it's just it's like saying. How can I be born again? Am I enter, to enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Right? It's the exact same type of argument. It, one is it's a straw man argument. Shallow, pretty shallow argument. Yeah, 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 because obviously Jesus isn't literally sprinkling blood uh, in the first place. He's not sprinkling his literal blood. It's, it's obviously a figure. Um, but these are the types of things that happen to people when they depart from the truth. I've seen it with Adventists who, who make claims about what Adventists believe that they never believe and that they never would have been taught or they wouldn't have known anybody who believed such things as Adventists. And they present it as Adventists believe this, whatever extreme idea that, that there is like, um, you know, anybody who wears jewelry is going to be lost and they should be treated in, you know, in some such a manner or whatever, where, you know, we wouldn't have that extreme of view. They'll present something in the most extreme way. One person even said that Adventists sacrifice pigs, you know. I don't know where they got that, but they supposedly were raised as Seventh-day Adventists, and that's what they were saying that Adventists do. Right. So so people can when they leave the truth, they can misrepresent it. Um, now, uh, Peter put up a quote here from First Thessalonians five uh, verses 12 to 15. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very high, highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, uh, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So I think the reason you shared this quote, Peter, is, is there's, there's this balance in this quote. One is how we treat others, and one is how we, uh, well, both of them are how we treat others those above us and all those the, those that we minister to. And that um, if I have rulership over someone, I don't force that authority. But if I have someone over authority, I should over authority over me. As long as it's reasonable, I should consider it. I need to listen to the counsel that comes, right? Um, but getting back to this question, about Wagner falling away. It's clear that he does. Uh, they remove his credentials. Now, Jones's case is different, as we're going to see. Um, now, Jones made some mistakes as far as his association with Kellogg, and he does go off on and takes the accepts the new view of the daily. So we're going to see that about Jones. Um, but he also takes some extreme views regarding religious liberty. And um, and also falls into a belief that Ellen White is being manipulated. And part of that has to do with his connection with Kellogg and other people. So he believes that Ellen White uh, is contradicting herself. So he has this problem with Sister White. And that's going to come to four in the 1909 General Conference. I think it's 1909. Um, where we're going to see his statements and Ellen White's statements at that General Conference. Now, Jones does later uh, recant, right? So he, he later recognizes his error um, before he dies. So, so there's a difference here between Jones and Wagner, how they end up. But also there's a difference in what kind of problems that they are having. Uh, Jones is almost totally attributable to uh, the conflict that he has with others. And... Uh, so it's it's a lot more complicated as far as figuring out where his where he went wrong. Uh, but with Wagner, it's pretty clear it's just open sin. So uh, that he's not going to repent of. <clears throat> okay, 
So, so one of the criticisms, again, is Wieland, in short, um, put Jones and Wagner in a much better light than they should. Now, I think that's partly true, but I don't think that you could take the view of George R. Knight and others who just say Jones and Wagner were basically fanatical, especially Jones, and that, you know, this last generation theology is attributable to Jones, and then later, of course, to people like M.L. Andreessen, right? So they this idea that we need this final generation that's going to vindicate Christ's character is looked down upon by the church as last generation theology. So they see it as a deviation from Jones and Wagner's message in 1888, when in fact it is really essential to understanding their message. <clears throat> okay, in those same years preceding 1888, the Lord was preparing his calling. Uh, the message of truth found A.T. Jones as a private in the U.S. Army, although not a product of the schools. He studied night and day, amassing a great store of historical and biblical knowledge. J.H. Washburn, who knew him personally, told us that he was a humble, earnest, and deep-feeling person whose effectual prayers gave evidence that he knew the Lord. Now, that's an interview in June 4th, 1950. Now, when you look at somebody like George R. Knight, who wrote 1888 to Apostasy about A.T. Jones, uh, he sees Jones as a hothead, right? And we've talked before about how, how are we to understand 1888? And um, when Froome looks at it, he says, well, we need to listen to, you know, we need to read their original documents. Uh, we need to read uh, what other people thought who were there on both sides of the issue, um, you know, in the spirit of prophecy as well. But the one thing I don't think we can count on is a negative reviews of people as individuals. And why is that? Why, if we are to take an account of an individual based upon the people who knew him, uh, why do we put such weight on those types of personal uh, accounts? Personal they, feelings, based on yeah, feelings. There, there's feelings involved, right? So yeah. I'm not, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, Jeff, uh, um, there, you know, I can't remember your last name. It's like you got Ritz or, or Ritz, Ritz or, or Ritz. Ritz. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff Ritz, you know, and 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 he's this type of person, you know, and I've had all kinds of dealings with him, and and you can't trust him, and whatever. Um, how do I know? that what that person has said is true. It could be that that person, everything that he says about Jeff Ritz is actually more true about himself. And generally I find that when somebody has an evil report of an individual, that it's, it's actually saying more about them than it is about the individual that they bear the evil report of. That's also often true of good reports of individuals. So sometimes, you know, a person will give a really good account of an individual who maybe, you know, he looks at better than he should, but a lot of that has to, has to do with the character of the individual giving that good report. He sees the best in the other person, right? He could pick at things that, you know, that the other people are picking at, but he sees the positive attributes of that individual and encourages those attributes in that individual. When we pick at people's negative aspects, we're actually magnifying that um, and, and driving the person often to develop those attributes. Right? Does that make sense? So, so I rather listen to a good report, but I also know good report may not necessarily be true, but J.S. J. Washburn says that Jones was humble. Well, if you read 1888 to Apostasy, A.T. Jones, 1888 to Apostasy by George R. Knight, Jones, the last thing he is, is humble. He is an arrogant, uh, pushy, um, you know, 
he wants to be in control. He doesn't listen to anybody. He's, he's you know, the word that, you know, kingly power, that would be A.T. Jones, right? According to George R. Knight. That's how he paints him, right? Um, and you can see this with, with other people. You can see people, for instance, with uh, Jeff Pippinger, people who loved him, um, and still do love him, and, and other people who have all kinds of negative things to say about him. And, and I found this in my own experience so many times um, uh, that when somebody is telling you about someone, they're really telling you about themselves. So I would say probably J.H. Washburn is a um, humble, earnest, and deep-feeling person, right? Because that's how he sees A.T. Jones. But we know when we look at our own hearts, um, we're not all of the evil that some people think of us as, and we're definitely not the saints that some people think of us as, right? Um, we can see that, you know, you know I know my mother... She thought I was a wonderful person, you know, growing up. I don't see it that way, but she looks at the good in everyone if she can find it. There's only been a couple of individuals I think that she couldn't see any good in. Um, but the thing is, when we see, when we look at these qualities that we like in people, we, we need to encourage them in those things, not attack them in the things that, that we see as problems. But anyway, that's kind of an aside. Um, but uh, Whelan and Short, they're going to look at Jones and Wagner in a more positive light than the critics of Jones and Wagner's message. Uh, no, he as says, an aside, you know, what's that? As, as, an, as an aside, Theodore, I do recall one time you mentioning to me uh, someone that we both know and your mother had something not nice to say about him and yeah. it was the first time that you ever remembered her saying anything not nice so it must have been true <laughs> that person yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's quite the first thing i was thinking of there's only two people i can think of but anyway you know and i grew up that i never heard negative things about people from my mom and my dad we didn't hear criticisms of people in the church or anything like that or relatives never was uh evil spoken of of anyone. And I think that's an important characteristic to have. Um, anyway, he goes on here. Uh, Young Jones' keen intellect was balanced by warm, simple, childlike faith. In the days when he was used of God, he was powerful in preaching and in personal ministry. In the years immediately following in 1888, there were significant demonstrations of the Spirit of God working through him including special ministry in Washington and at the U.S. Senate, to defeat the Blair Sunday Bill. In fact, this near century of continuing religious liberty that Americans enjoy is a legacy of the effective efforts of the unrecognized and unhonored Jones and Wagner in opposing religious intolerance of their day. The Spirit of God was truly preparing these two young men to herald uh, to the remnant church and to the world itself, the beginning of the long-awaited loud cry. Now, so we've read Jones' um, 1893 and 1895 General Conference bulletins. Now, in 1893, Jones uh, was clearly understanding that 1888 was this message, uh, the beginning of the latter rain and the loud cry, and that the loud cry uh, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down already in 18, 4, 1892. So in 1892, um, and that had to do with uh, the Chicago World's Fair and the things that were happening in connection with that. And, um, and so in 1893, he's looking for the, the message to swell to a loud cry. And one of the things that we can then say about Jones is his belief that, that the return of Christ was going to be soon and that this message was going to go to the world. Um, we could see the discouragement that he would have in how the message was not just rejected in 1888, but also continued to be rejected. And all of the problems that were existing in the church must have been very discouraging 
to him. And this would, and how Kellogg was being treated, all these types of things, um, all of this politics, Jones got caught up in. And um, so, so that's one of the problems that happened after 1888. So in the church's view that, you know, eventually we accepted Jones and Wagner's message, we've seen that that's not the case, that um, what they have done is, is redefined the message, claim to have accepted, but have always rejected it. Now, uh, this book, 1888, re-examined, um, and there's other books by Leland and Short, but um, uh, they really believe the idea that there needs to be corporate repentance in order for um, the work to be accomplished. The church as an organization, the leaders have to repent of the rejection of this message and that they have to accept this message. And of course, we don't believe that that's the case. This is about individuals accepting the message, not the church. Um, so he's going to have this uh, quote, which we well know. Uh, the Lord in, great, in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Jones and Wagner. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, God gave his messengers just what the people needed. For eight years following 1888, Ellen White often spoke of these two young men as the Lord's messengers, endorsing them in words never uttered of any others. There are between 200 and 300 such enthusiastic statements from her. In 1890, she said, suppose that you blot out the testimony that has been going through these last two years, proclaiming the righteousness of Christ. Who can point to, who can you point to as bringing out special light for the people? In 1888, she had said, God is presenting to the minds of men divinely appointed precious gems of truth appropriate for our time. The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. When she first heard the message of Wagner, she immediately perceived its, signif its true significance it was a special revelation for the church and for the world. I've had the question asked, what do you think of this light which these men are presenting? Well, I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. This is what I've been trying to present before your minds. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas at Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I've said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have not had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Now, this is a really interesting statement. So first, we know that Ellen White understood this message prior to Jones and Wagner presenting it. But she says that this is the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips. Now, why is God using Jones and Wagner to present this message that Ellen White already has? What is the reason for that? How would we understand it when God raises up messengers? What does that mean? Why couldn't Ellen White just give this message? Why did God have to raise up A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner? Because of the mess that had been occurring within the church with um, the president of the general council and Uriah Smith. Okay, so general, so you got G.I. Butler, Rye Smith, all these problems. Okay. Now, why couldn't Ellen White just give this message? I mean, she's known this message. She said she'd been presenting it for the last 45 years. Um, 
But God now has to raise up messengers. Why? Why does he have to specifically choose messengers to do this? What is that telling us? That's bringing the message through alternative channels, very much like if let's let's say someone was raised from the dead to give this because mm. then people would would look and say, "All right, maybe we'd better listen mm -hmm. right, so you have these because nobody's listening to Ellen White anymore, right? They've set her aside. Basically, if you compare this to the period of the judges, I mean, the church is in apostasy. I mean, Heidi and I are only just a little bit half through five testimonies. Um, but the condition of the church in that period in the 1880s is really very parallel to what we see in the church today. I mean, we would think, well, they're all just very, you know, good Adventists. Uh, but there's a lot going on. Now, there isn't as many Adventists, um, but they're very worldly already at that time. Um, you know, we wouldn't maybe see it that way from our perspective today, but from the Lord's perspective of what God wanted and what the church was doing, um, the church had departed from the truth. And, and this was you know, to a great degree, the responsibility of the leadership. The leadership was not heeding the counsel that was being given in the spirit of prophecy. It was a, to a huge degree. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the Lord comes and he raises up messengers. He raises up judges, right, to deliver them. And, and so we got Jones and Wagner. These are the Lord's messengers. And they're going to be mistreated. And we see this always happen with, when somebody is presenting the truth uh, within the church. People are going to, they're going to have all kinds of stories. They're going to mock them. Uh, they're going to misrepresent things they're saying um, and try to create as much disruption as they can. This is what happened. Um, but it needed to happen. But we also know that at that time, um, you know, Jesus didn't come back. The message was rejected. This message has to be not accepted by the organized church. It just needs to be, it needs to come to fruition. And we know that uh, the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. It's the first, second, and third angels' messages. Both the first and the second angels' message. and and also the third angel's message, are all about righteousness by faith because they're the everlasting gospel. Righteous, The third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. That is, the third angel's message shows the completeness of that work. It's the final step. It's where Christ's character is going to be perfectly reproduced in his people. This is what the third angel's message accomplishes. And it accomplishes it under the most trying of circumstances in the time of the Sunday law, the Sunday and the Sabbath confrontation. Um, but you can't have a third without a first and a second. So we know because those, the prophetic foundation had been rejected and basically uh, a Protestant um, uh, way of understanding the Bible, exegesis, um, was being accepted because Adventists wanted to be accepted by the world. They believed that if they were accepted, that they could have a greater influence in presenting their message. And we also know that they were involved in a lot of debating. So they had a, a debate of spirit. And, um, and so this is the condition of the church. They can win debates, but they can't win hearts. And the people that they do bring into the church, they've been using the wrong bait. So they've, they've not gotten true Christians into the church. They've brought a lot of people in who are unconverted. And so this is a problem. So Jones and Wagner come with a message that's going to present clearly the message of righteousness by faith. 
<clears throat> okay. So in it's he says here, as early as April 1st, 1890, Ellen White, growing in understanding, applied the language of Revelation 18 to the 1888 message. Several have written to me inquiring if the 1888 message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message. Um, in verity, the prophet declares, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, again, I've made the, con the, the point, I have a contention with what people understand about that statement. That is, they think that only the third angel's message is righteousness by faith. But when she says it is the third angel's message, in verity, or righteousness by faith, is the third angel's message in verity. It doesn't exclude the first and second angel's message as not including righteousness by faith, right? Because they are the everlasting gospel. Now, in 1892, she was ready to state unequivocally that the message was indeed the beginning of a long-awaited loud cry. The loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Now, uh, let's review in Herald, November 22, 1892. Um, now, when we think about the loud cry, the loud cry, where does Ellen White place the loud cry? When it comes to Revelation 18 and the third angel. Is it not just before the time of trouble? Okay. Um, well, yes. It's, it's going to be before the close of probation. Um, help to bring about the time of trouble. Yes, it's going to be connected. So in um, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, um, she says under the chapter 34 of the Loud Cry, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. They were descending to earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth and unite his voice with the third angel. So this is the angel of Revelation 18. He descends to the earth and unites his voice with the third angel and give power and force to this message. Now, when we think about this other angel, Ellen White's clear that this other angel is the second angel, right? So we'll sometimes say the fourth angel's message, um, but it has the same message as the second angel, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, right? It also contains uh, the admonition to come out of her, right? Which is not in the second angel's message in Revelation 14. She says, great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which went before and followed after this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon. Yeah. Can, you, was, can, can you scroll that up? I, uh, I'm not able to okay. see what you're okay. reading. Yeah, okay, I'm reading this from here. I'll share the different screen. So here, here's the screen that I'm using. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, so she says, um, uh, the message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel is again given, right? So she says that this is the second angel's message that's again given. Um, with the addition of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. So uh, we know that there is a partial fall that happens with Protestantism in in Millerite history, but that that fall progresses. So that's the addition of the corruptions. That is, 
the type of the theology, the licentiousness, all of those things just keep magnifying more and more. And so that's why there's going to be a work to come out of her, my people, which isn't a call under the second angel's message in 1844. Uh, the work of this angel comes in at the right time and joins in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells into a loud cry. And the people of God are fitted up everywhere to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united in the message and fearlessly proclaimed the great power of the third angel's message. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seemed to be an addition to the third message, and joined it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. So she parallels the loud cry and the midnight cry. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints, and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling upon God's people to come out of her that they might escape her fearful doom. Now we're going to know, of course, from other statements that basically what you have is uh, the Sunday law, and then you have the loud cry, right? So this mighty angel coming down, Ellen White uh, parallels to the Sunday law, right? So mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at the Sunday law. Um, but yet she's saying that that mighty angel came down in 1888. So, so obviously the Sunday law didn't come, but the message that was needed to bring about, to prepare people for the Sunday law, to stand that test, test that's what, came down. That's why it's the beginning of the latter rain, the beginning of the loud cry. Um, it's not it's not the Sunday law at that time. Um, okay, so um, there's a lot more that we could look at here, but we're going to go back to our document instead. And uh, before we do that, we also have um, Okay, so this is from Peter there. He says, it is quite possible that Elder Jones or Elder Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. So this is Ellen White saying this, right? Um, uh, right, so I'm just, so this is a letter to Uriah Smith, September 19th, 1892. So Ellen White says, uh, it's quite possible that Elder Jones or Elder Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. By the temptations, uh, oh, oh, pardon me, but if they should be, this would not prove that they had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. But should this happen, how many would take this position and enter into a fatal delusion because they are not under the control of the Spirit of God? They walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire they have kindled and the light which God has given. And they walk in blindness, as did the Jews. So you can see this very thing. This is the statement I was looking for. Thanks, Peter. Um, so this is the very way uh, in which people now look at Jones and Wagner. I've heard it many times. Well, you know, they fell away. So obviously their message can't be true. And, um, and of course, Ellen White's quite clear. The message was from God. If they were to fall away, if they, they succumb to the temptations of the enemy, does it mean that they had a false message? Now, it's, it's obviously bad uh, when people fall away because it does, in, in many people's eyes, uh, diminish the value of that message. If we fall away from the truth, you know, people that look to us as, as somebody who was truly a Christian or truly an Adventist, and we fall away from the truth, that can discourage many people, right? So to be faithful to God is important um, just in that regard. 
notwithstanding, it's also important for you to do to be faithful to God. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, So Elder Butler was one responsible officer of the church, was foremost in opposing the precious light and the loud cry. Few others were spiritually able to transcend his negative influence. In his blind opposition to the loud cry, we may see the tragic fulfillment of the inspired warning sent him on October 1st, 1885. There are some who have a desire uh, to have a decision made at once as to what the correct view in the point, what is the correct view in the point under discussion? As this would please Elder Butler, it is advised that this question should be settled at once. But our minds prepared for such a decision. I could not sanction this course. They are not prepared to make safe decisions. I see no reason for the wrought up state of feeling that has been created at this meeting. Um, Minneapolis, 1888. The message is coming from your president. Uh, at Battle Creek are calculated to stir you up to take a decided position. But I warn you against doing this. Excited feelings will lead to rash moves. I can never forget the experience which we had in Minneapolis or the things which were then revealed to me in regard to the spirit that controlled men, the words spoken, the actions done in obedience to the powers of evil. They were moved at the meeting by another spirit, and they knew not that God had sent these young men to bear a special message to them, which they treated with ridicule and contempt, not realizing that the heavenly intelligences were looking upon them. I know that at that time, the spirit of God was insulted. So that's in 1892, that one. <clears throat> um, so we're familiar with some of these ideas that uh, there was this message. And uh, instead of, addressing the message and studying it prayerfully and carefully, uh, they attacked the messengers. Okay. So so this section, so-called faults of messengers, no excuse to reject their message. And this is true of any messenger. Any messenger has faults. Right? They have characteristics, personalities. They have experience and all of these things are limited but we know even christ who had no fault did people find fault with him yeah definitely so, so even somebody who is manifesting the spirit of christ uh we can often find faults where there are none. The faults really just lie in ourselves. Um, so this is a statement from Review and Herald Extra, December 23rd, 1890. In the manifestation of the power that lightens the earth with its glory, they will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears and they will brace themselves against it. Because the Lord does not work according to their expectation, expectations and ideas, they will oppose the work. Now, this is, is true um, of any time there is truth that people, that many people, because they don't know the truth, uh, will see it as dangerous. Um, we saw this with, you know, the 2520, people just saying this is something dangerous, which I have no idea how the 2520 could have been dangerous, even if it was not correct. Even if we, we, we were incorrect about the 2520, I don't see how it could possibly have been dangerous. The study of the 2520 would be a study of Adventist history and people would learn things, right? So I never understood this idea. It's dangerous to look into something um, and some people had such an idea that it was dangerous uh, that they wouldn't even utter the word 2520. They would say that number, you know, maybe they couldn't remember the number. Some people would call it the 2025, things like that. But anyway, we see that when there is truth, we see this uh, almost supernatural opposition to truth. 
that you don't see with when there's error. Right? People can, you know, put up with a lot of error. When somebody's presenting truth, you're going to see people's hackles rise. Um, so anyway, uh, we have um, a statement here from a sermon, March 9th, 1890, manuscript 2, 1890. Now, I want you to be careful, every one of you, what position you take, whether you enshroud yourselves in the clouds of unbelief because you see imperfections, you see a word or a little item perhaps that may take place and judge them, Jones and Wagner, from that. You are to see whether God is working with them and then you are to acknowledge the spirit of God that is revealed in them. And if you choose to resist it, you will be acting just as the Jews acted. Um, so we know that the experiencing brethren were opposed to this message. Those whom God has sent with the message are only men, but what is the character of the message which they bear? Will you dare to turn from or make light of the warnings because God did not consult you as to what would be preferred? God gave you opportunity to come up armed and equipped to the help of the Lord. But did you make ready? You sat still and did nothing. You left of the word of the Lord to fall unheeded to the ground. And now the Lord has taken men who were boys when you were standing at the forefront of the battle and has given them the message and the work which you did not take upon you. Will you criticize? Will you say they are getting out of their place? Yet you did not fulfill the place they are now called to fill. So another reason why we can see that John Jones and Wagner were chosen is the leadership was not doing its work. And so God had to raise up someone else to do that work. Um, those who have, those whom God has sent with a message are only men. Some have turned from the message of the righteousness of Christ to criticize the men, right? So by criticizing the men, we are not doing the work of God. If somebody's presenting error, you show where it is error. And when somebody is presenting truth, because you can't show that it is error, what you generally tend to do is to attack the person giving that message. Um, so here, um, they say, one of our esteemed denominational authors attempts to show that the 1888 opposition was justifiable. Note that he emphasizes the faults of Jones and Wagner and blames them for causing the rejection of their message. Thus, he, in fact, perpetuates the 1888 prejudice and sets our clock back 100 years. Not only was he, Jones, naturally abrupt, but he cultivated singularity of speech and manner, was at times obstreperous, and he gave just cause for resentment. Jones and Wagner shouting, Christ is all, gave evidence that they were not wholly sanctified. Incorrectly cites Mrs. White as supporting the idea that Jones and Wagner contributed a contentious spirit to the terrible experience at the Minneapolis conference. They bore almost exclusively upon faith as the factor of salvation, were not disposed to consider the other side calmly, were not wholly without fault in conceit and arrogance, failed to show the humility and love uh, which righteousness by faith imparts. Extreme teaching of Jones and Wagner is observable still in the mystical pronouncements of those who make faith all and works nothing. They were imperfect channels. As we look back on the controversy, we perceive that it was the rancorous, it was the rancors aroused by Jones and Wagner's personalities, much more than the differences in beliefs which caused the difficulty. So this is uh, Arthur Spaulding, Captains of the Host, page 951 and 602. Now, Adventists read this type of material. Right? We have Froome, um, uh, his book, um, Movement of Destiny. Of course, we have Spaulding before that. And we also have um, uh, George R. Knight presently and others. And, and it's all through... Uh, our church, that is, if we were to ask the average Adventist about Jones and Wagner's, what kind of characters they have, what kind of personalities, we would get this view. 
Now, every one of us has people who do not like us. Well, maybe there's somebody there who people like, but I know even, even my mom or my brother David, people that most people really liked, they always had their enemies. And if you pick the words of, of those that you know oppose a person as an example of their character, it's not going to be very accurate. Um, you know, I had a pastor who collected, uh, he had a big binder of all of these people that he interviewed about me. Uh, you know, my ex-wife and um, um, people that I used to know um, to find out about me, right? And, and he formed his conception of who I was as a person by all of these interviews. And after he had preached a sermon against me personally in church, uh, the conference asked him to sit with me and uh, to uh, discuss, you know, what he, why he had presented this message. And he brought out this binder and went through and named each person and what they said about me. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Um, so, so we can do that with people, right? We can, and especially if you're uh, mining for negative comments, right? I don't know if you've ever seen people who do that. They will express something negative about a person and they want to see if you agree with them. And, it's and you called, might... Uh, confirm it's called confirmation bias. Yeah, well, it's a confirmation bias. But, but often they do this just so that they can say that other people, they can, they can blame their, their opinion on other people, Right. So all these people are saying this about me. But in reality, maybe only a few of those people even said anything negative about you. They just didn't disagree when that person said something negative about you, right? And, and I've had this happen where people would uh, say, you know, well, so-and-so said this about you. So what I do is I go to the person and ask them, did you say such and such? And they'll be like, no, you know, here's what I actually said. And, and you know, they obviously had a problem with you. And I, and I recognize that, but I didn't say what they said I said. Now, they, of course, could not be, maybe they're not telling the truth. Maybe they did say it. But, but often I think the person was just, you know, misquoted. Uh, just because they, they didn't, the other person was looking for those negative statements. The point is, we know but that is not how a Christian should act. But this is gossip. This is the evil work. This is the work of the accuser of the brethren. And um, now we can make statements about Froome and Spalding and George R. Knight in that what they are doing, what they are saying is incorrect. But I know nothing about them as, as individuals. For me to say that they have these certain types of personalities. I don't know anything about their personalities. I don't know how they come to have their views and opinions. I don't know. I just know the views and opinions are incorrect. And that's not how we are to do things. <clears throat> now, while it is true that Ellen White rebuked A.T. Jones for being momentarily too sharp on Uriah Smith, in the pre-session controversy on the Ten Horns, she nevertheless uh, defended the two brethren as Christians and gentlemen. And she more than hinted that a goodly number of the opposing brethren did not evidence such heavenly credentials. We have modern writers who paint Jones and Wagner in the same fault-finding terms as, their, as did their 1888 opponents. But the two messengers enjoyed Ellen White's unqualified endorsement. It is true that after the 1888 era finally ended, they faltered and lost their way. And this is probably the reason why modern writers want to blame them for the 1888 tragedy, but they misjudge the facts. Ellen White foretold that this tragic development would take place if opposition to their message continued. Now, now we have the quote there that, that Peter gave us there. Um, yeah, and uh, so that that quote 
Now, to say, I think they're overstating the quote. She says, it is quite possible that all of Jones or Elder Wag may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. Um, so I don't know if she particularly uh, said that this tragic development would take place if opposition to their message continued. I mean, Jones and Wagner could have acted differently. So wasn't a guarantee that they would fall away. But definitely it, it contributed to that. Nevertheless, she added their later failure would in no way invalidate their message and ministry from 1888 to 1896, the period of her endorsements. For us to criticize these messengers during that era of the beginning loud cry is to endorse the objections of their contemporary opponents. Logically, it justifies spurning the special blessings which came from heaven. It's amazing that after a hundred years, we still feel compelled to blame the Lord's mess special messengers for the consequences of our own unbelief. Ellen White notably regarded Jones and Wagner as showing a genuine Christian spirit during and after the Minneapolis conference. Contemporary eyewitness accounts substantiate her judgment. Now, um, when they have this 1888 to 1896 um, endorsement, I, I don't know if I would stop it at 1896, maybe for, for Wagner. Um, I don't think Jones is off in 1897 or 1898. Um, uh, but it's going to happen later in, in definitely by the time you get into uh, 1905 uh, that you're going to have some problems. But as far as the message, Ellen White never um, uh, criticizes the message that Jones and Wagner were giving. Um, at least in that time. So that's probably what he's referring to. Um, so here's just one of the statements regarding uh, Brother Wagner. Dr. Wagner has spoken to us in a straightforward manner. Of, of one thing I am certain, as Christians, you have no right to entertain feelings of enmity, unkindness, and prejudice towards Dr. Wagner was presented his view in a plain, straightforward manner as a Christian should. I believe him to be perfectly honest in his views, and I would respect his feelings and trust him as a Christian brother, so long as there is no evidence that he is unworthy. The fact that he honestly holds some views of scripture, differing from yours and mine, is no reason we should treat him as an offender, as a dangerous man, and make him the subject of unjust just criticism. And of course, we see this happening all of the time. That somebody holds a differing view from me is no reason for me uh, to criticize him as a person, to say that he's dangerous. Personal attacks, personal yeah. type attacks. Yeah, and this has been one of the problems, I believe, in this movement uh, with many people in the past is that, um, that mistakes were made in regard to how people were treated merely because they held a differing view. And that drove them further away from the message and ultimately led uh, to the situation where they had departed from the message completely. Now, it doesn't take away that person's individual responsibility. Some people cannot handle unjust criticism. You know, it's just some people can't do it. You know, when they're misrepresented, and 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 their you know stories are told about them. That's it, right? Um, some people can. So, so you know, you you just uh, it, it. I hate it when I see people being misrepresented, and I see their reaction, and I see them being driven away from the truth. Um. I just think it's unfair, but it does happen. And uh, we need to be aware of the danger of that. If there's anything dangerous, it's it's misrepresenting and criticizing people unjustly. That's the danger. To say that somebody's a dangerous man, that's a very dangerous thing to do, rather than to follow the counsel that God has given. <clears throat> uh, 
is they say a young minister who came to the Minneapolis meeting with a prejudice in mind against him left has left on record his impressions of the spirit which Wagner showed. Being decidedly prejudiced in favor of Elder Butler and against E.J. Wagner, I went to that meeting with a prejudiced mind. With pencil and notebook in hand, I listened for heresy and was ready to see flaws and find fault with whatever was presented. As Elder Wagner started in, it seemed very different from what I was looking for. By the close of his second lesson, I was ready to concede that he was going to be fair, and his manner did not show any spirit of controversy, nor did he mention any opposition that he was anticipating. Very soon, his manner and the pure gospel that he was setting forth materially changed my mind and attitude, and I was an earnest listener for truth. At the close of Elder Wagner's fourth or fifth lesson, I was subdued. I was a subdued, repenting sinner. After Elder Wagner had finished his 11 studies, the influence which had, in quite a measure, taken out of a good many the debating spirit, uh, had, had, and that's the end of the sentence, um, <clears throat> so Ellen White even defended the bold teaching and apparently iconoclastic spirit of the young messengers iconoclastic means you know like somebody who's you can see the word icon there um, that is they're tearing down the idols of people uh, men will go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ it is their work to make crooked things straight. Some things must be torn down. Some things must be built up. Let no soul complain of the servants of God who have come to them with a heaven-sent message. Do not any longer pick flaws in them, saying they are too positive. They talk too strongly. They may talk strongly, but it is. but is it not needed? God will make the ears of the hearers tingle if they will not heed his voice or his message. Ministers, do not dishonor your God and grieve his Holy Spirit by casting reflections on the ways and manners of the men he would choose. God knows the character. He sees the temperament of the man he has chosen. He knows that none but earnest, firm, determined, strong-feeling men will view this work in its vital importance. I will put such firmness and decision into their testimonies that they will make a break against the barriers of Satan. <clears throat> a modern historian describes the unpolished and supposedly unlettered A.T. Jones as a towering, angular man with a loping gait and uncouth postures and gestures. That's Spalding. Ellen White had a very different view of him. There are Christian workers who have not received a collegiate education because it was impossible for them to secure this advantage. But God has given evidence that he has chosen them. He has made them effectual co-workers with himself. They have a teachable spirit. They feel their dependence upon God, and the Holy Spirit is with them to help their infirmities. There is heard in his voice the echo of the voice of Christ. It is evidence that he walks with God, that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. He has brought the truth into the inner sanctuary of the soul. It is to him a living reality, and he presents the truth in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. The people hear the joyful sound. God speaks to their hearts through the man consecrated to his service. He becomes really eloquent. He is earnest and sincere and is beloved by those for whom he labors. His defects will be forgiven and forgotten. His hearers will not become weary or disgusted but will thank God for the message of grace sent them through his servant. They, they, that is the opponents, can hold the objectionable Adam under the magnifying glasses of their imagination until the Adam looks like a world and shuts out from their view the precious light of heaven. Why take so much account of that which may appear to you as objectionable in the messenger and sweep away um, all the evidences that God has given to balance the mind in regard to truth. Um, Ellen White says, I have traveled from place to place, attending meetings where the message of the righteousness of Christ was preached. I considered it a privilege to stand by the side of my brethren and give my testimony with the message for the time. Okay, so we're going to stop there for today.
Um, I know I did a lot of reading and a few comments here. A any final thoughts on what we have read before we close with prayer? Um, at the beginning, you talked about, you asked question, why did uh, God need someone else to give the message? Um, mm -hmm. Ellen White often, uh, it was her role to see truth, not to not to discover it. She didn't discover the Sabbath. Um, mm -hmm. Others brought it to her attention. And uh, same with um, the cornfield vision of uh, higher medicine. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, he saw the truth in Ellen, then God later on showed, hey, Ellen White, this was truth. And so uh, she didn't seal the truth, but God did give her, did give her, as a blessing to people to recognize truth and then often to expound upon it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and of course she had been giving this message, but it wasn't being accepted. That is, there was a lot going on. And uh, so God chose other messengers to give a message. And so we need to be open to hear a message wherever it comes from. One of the things I've learned is, um, you know, there's some people I don't particularly like, you know, I don't like their personality. Uh, but I remember when I was at um, School of the Prophets back in 2016, when Heidi and I were there as students. And so one lady, she did a presentation and, um, you know, I didn't particularly like her, but I listened to what she said. I didn't like how she kind of talked down to us as as if we were like in kindergarten. Um, but I never let that hinder me from hearing what she had to say. And um, that's sometimes a hard thing to do. We like to, you know, listen to the voices that sort of agree with our sentiments. It's hard to read somebody and learn from somebody who has not even just maybe a personality we don't, don't like, but maybe even holds to some error, but it doesn't mean that there isn't something there uh, that they have seen that we can learn from. And as a teacher, you know, I can learn a lot from my, my students. Um, I don't come as just, I'm the teacher and I know everything. I've learned a lot as a guitar teacher that I wouldn't have learned if I had a closed mind. So to be open to truth is important. But as far as these messengers that God chose, they are faulty, as all of us are. But the message was not faulty. And we have to be careful that we don't reject truth just because we have, we can see the faults in the individuals presenting that truth. Okay, well, thanks everyone uh, for your time. And uh, let's close with prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the messages that have been given in the past throughout the scriptures, uh, the words that have been spoken that have revealed to us our sins. And Lord, we confess that we are often resistant to light uh, because of our pride, things that we don't want to see in ourselves. And so we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to teach us and lead us. I pray that you can bless each person studying uh, these messages, studying the truth and searching for truth, that you can lead them into all truth through your spirit. Uh, be with us on this Sabbath. May it truly be a blessing. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.